Welcome to Red Team TV, sponsored by Red Team Thinking. Bad leaders react, good leaders plan, and great leaders think. Each week, we bring you new ideas and insights from business leaders, military leaders, and thought leaders. Ideas and insights that will help you think more deeply and lead more effectively, so that you can better navigate your complex world. Here again are your hosts, best-selling business author and top-rated leadership speaker Bryce Hoffman, and former Royal Air Force Wing Commander and Business Agility Coach Marcus Dimbleby. Hello, this is Bryce Hoffman, President of Red Team Thinking and author of the book Red Teaming. Welcome back to the show. I am joined as always by Marcus Dimbleby, Vice President of Red Team Thinking in London today. And do we have a guest for you? Listen to this bio. Jose Carella is a multi-industry and interdisciplinary military veteran and consumer packaged goods senior executive with progressive product, operations, finance, brand marketing, and strategy experience at the corporate enterprise, global sector, and local market level. Recognized for operationalizing strategy, innovation, and human capital programs, and labeled a high-energy change agent with a bias for action. Jose's career highlights include retooling legacy business models to accelerate innovation in record time, leading PL teams to successfully restage and relaunch businesses and brands towards growth, and standing up five first-of-their-kind organizations focused on transforming large-scale enterprises. In short, Jose delivers big things fast, which incidentally is also the title of his upcoming book, which he's co-authoring. Big Things Fast is a field manual that maps out practical tools and techniques for new team leaders looking to facilitate meaningful growth in themselves and their teams. What an introduction. Wow. Jose, welcome to the show. Thanks, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Yeah, hearing that introduction, uh, third party, if you will, is is a little scary, a little daunting. Wow. It's like, who is that person? <laughs> who is that person? Indeed, Big Jose, who is that person? Tell us, <laughs> tell us a little bit more about yourself. No, I appreciate that. Yeah, th thanks for the introduction. Um, I guess a couple of the highlights there is that I started my career in the Air Force. That's kind of the opening line of the introduction is that I'm a 10-year military veteran. Um, was not, not not a pilot, wasn't a trigger puller. A lot, I spent a lot of my time in laboratories and did a lot of product development in advanced science and technology programs, mostly in the security space, so digital space. And that's kind of where the bug hit, I think, is once you start working with operators, I mean, as you, as, as you both know, and based on your backgrounds, is that you're given a lot of responsibility uh, very early in your military career. And so I'm 20 plus, I'm, I'm young, 20 year old, and here you go, here's a half a billion dollar security system that we want you to be responsible to be deployed globally, worldwide with a team of like 40 people. You're like, okay, I'm, I'm equipped for this. Sure. <laughs> I'll <laughs> <I'm> do <ready."> that. <laughs> Uh, and, but the bug hit at that point, I was like, yeah, I get it now. Operators need tools. They want products. They want it fast. They don't want to hear about all the troubles you encountered at sea. Did you bring in the ship? And that kind of just, that locked in at that point. That was the big key insight. And my boss at the time, he just believed in me and, and kind of gave me that opportunity. And that quote that I just talked about bringing in the ship is, it was proudly prominent in his office. <laughs> and so then coming out of the military, when I was kind of done in that space, um, joined Procter & Gamble and spent about seven years there in finance and accounting, started in finance and accounting, and then worked my way through marketing and brand management type stuff. Again, the, the thread that came through is how do you help teams develop now brands instead of kind of technology products, but develop and deploy brands to consumers. And the consumers don't care about the processes that you're following in, in, in your company. They don't care about the bureaucracy. They don't care about anything. They just want to know, do I have my stuff? Do I have my do I have my toothbrush, my floss, my rinse? I was in the oral care business. Do I have my Pepto, my Prilo, all those brands that you know PNG has? And then so from that it was all right. I'm starting to build out this playbook. I'm starting to understand how what really works and how does it really come to life. And you're starting to see some common threads. And uh, joined Kimberly Clark in 2014. So I've, I've kind of completed my eighth year here. And same kind of thing. Same threads coming through is how do we quickly innovate, bring products to market in a meaningful way. That are meaningfully different for consumers, right? Continuing to blow away their expectations uh, with best in class products and things like that. And so the arc of my career, kind of the pulling threads are really around how do we quickly bring innovation? 
How do we break through the bureaucracy? How do we deliver that minimum viable bureaucracy to get innovation? <laughs> into that? I love that minimum viable bureaucracy. Wow. <laughs> that is like that. That should be the goal of every organization to develop minimum viable bureaucracy. And, and that's it. You know, it's like and that's what I try to teach all my teams that I've ever led, you know, whether it's in the Air Force and even now. And I've got the opportunity, the unique privilege of being in the kind of the enterprise strategy side of the house and working with global teams all over the place that are saying, we know what we can do, you know, and you and Marcus talk about this. Marcus talks about this a lot and and, and on his thread of conversations is it's in your team. Help us unlock it. Right. And so I've had that privilege of being able to work with these teams and say, here, here's kind of the, here's some playbook. Here's some tools that you can think about to help you break through that kind of bureaucracy. You have the solution. Our consumers want those solutions. How do you close the gap and find that minimum viable bureaucracy to go from supply to just giving giving consumers what they're looking for? So that's kind of been the arc of my career and that whole big things fast. That's where I was born. Uh, I was born very early in the military because we had to deliver big things fast. And the risk profile Mm -hmm. is such that if I didn't deliver something fast, there was lives at stake because it was a security system. Now, in consumer packaged goods, the risk is different. It's still very much we have to manage supply chain and innovation programs and all that to get consumers the products that they want. Uh, we saw this a lot come to life, especially in the paper business, right, A couple over the course of COVID. Can you talk a little bit about, just for people who don't know, what, what are some of Kimberly Clark's brands? Because I, I, I think of Kimberly Clark as one of the biggest companies that people know all the products but may not know the company itself. No, it's great. Yeah, so we're globally headquartered here in Dallas, Texas. Uh, when we've got kind of, and then North America has run out of the, you know, Wisconsin and Chicago, kind of the Midwest. Um, the biggest brands you know about are Huggies, Kotex, Poise. Uh, on the paper side, you have Kleenex, you have Cottonelle, things like that. And so that's what we're known for. We have Scott, Scott Tissue as well. And so these are big, big global brands that have number one or number two position globally. And from a market share perspective, we're very proud of that. But all CPGs struggle with the same concept, with the same issues, right? Which is how do you go to market quickly with meaningfully differentiated products that consumers care about? And as you said, you know, a key to that is is something that I I saw during my my time as a journalist in every company that I covered, that the answers that companies need reside in those organizations. 100% of the time, I've never seen a company that there weren't people in the organization who knew the secret sauce, who knew what needed to be done, but that it's it's the bureaucracy, it's the hierarchy, it's the complacency in some cases that holds that back, that keeps those good ideas from being surfaced. And so this idea that you you put out of, of creating this minimum viable bureaucracy that is is lean and and thin in the sense that it doesn't create this this barrier, this layer of permafrost between the people who are doing the work, the people at the coalface and senior leadership. And that's what I find exists too often in organizations is this, this kind of permafrost layer that insulates the top of the house from, from the people who know what's going on and know how what needs to happen to move forward. And so if you could thaw that, if you can reduce that to a permeable membrane, yeah, right. then you have a great flow of ideas up and down the organization. No, that's exactly right. It's how do you find what is that that minimum viable is how quickly can we do that? And it's and it's really about managing through the risks and getting leaders enrolled, right? And you know, there's a couple of different frameworks out there uh, from from you know, lots of consultancies and also from like the pro side change management. That's another, you know, there's a lot of different frameworks and tech and methods that are out there that help you think through what is the stakeholder engagement map. You know, Bain Consulting calls it the sponsorship spine. Back in the military, what do we used to call it? The chain of command. Yep. You know, and so, but you can't say chain of command in the commercial world because sometimes I get that kind of makes people uh, put up their barriers in terms like, oh, command and you're going to command me. It's like, no, we're not commanding. You're just, but there's a flow of leadership, a a chain of commitment, if you will, Mm -hmm. stakeholders, impacted audiences that you have to think through. And oftentimes we just start piling it on. And that's where you start getting from, Here's the minimum viable of impacted audience that we need to really work through. 
And then we start adding more layers and more layers and the permafrost gets thicker and thicker and thicker and thicker as opposed to saying, this is the minimum that we need to move and we're gonna move at the speed of trust. You have to trust that this layer, these individuals, whether they're, whether it's five or 10 or some kind of whatever number you determine, are empowered to actually execute this particular project platform innovation. But you have to allow that speed of trust to work its way through to keep that layer thin. That is so critical. And, and that trust, it's a two-way street. That trust is is comes from senior leadership trusting their teams. But it also comes from knowing that their teams have the skills and the capabilities they need to be able to make good decisions, to make to be able to make good choices at the coal face, so that you can trust them. Right? It's it's exactly right. it's about capability as well as confidence. And that I found as well that that has to be a default setting. You have to trust people by default. You know, in, in this day and age where we're fast moving bringing these quality people in, you know, you hope you're going to recruit the quality that you need. And then as you've done, Jose, you, know, you enable these people, you trust them to get on with what you've brought them in for while providing that leadership, that coaching support mechanism through that spine as it goes up and down and more often getting them to foster the trust in you. You know, you implicitly trust them because you know why you brought them in. And often the hard, hard thing to do is for the frontline operators is to trust their leadership spine because of probably the scarring that they may have had. And I think it's fascinating that where you are now, just from your quick journey you cantered through with us, you were doing this as a 20 year old young guy in the military, <laughs> you know, so you saw those problems and and I was the same. I, I saw those behaviors that impacted my capability to be as good as I could be. And therefore I've always vowed never to be like that as I've climbed up the greasy pole, if you will, to make sure that those below me were always protected. You know, my spine was sort of overarching them to protect them from above and keep pulling up as I climbed up the ladder as well. So I think it's fascinating to talk about this, as you say, this, this trust, the speed of trust, because the more we trust, the faster we can go. And that's why it's the baseline for Lencioni's five dysfunctions of a team, you know, trust first, that's right. followed by healthy conflict and, and it goes upwards. Yeah. That was that probably the most formative uh, you mentioned, like, you know, trusting in your team and for me, the thing that I've always held on to, you know, formative experience was very, again, back in the, the very first role, project management kind of big program that I was running was that the operators in the field were giving us feedback in terms of how to fix this particular uh, charging station that we were having. We had a tactical remote security system. And we were hearing from the 18, 19 year olds in the field that were out in Southwest Asia, you know, that were out in the desert. And they were telling us, this is the problem that you're facing. But back at headquarters, we were doing design thinking. We we're doing all this engineering, all this. Yeah, we we're reflecting with 10,000 pound brain geniuses and PhDs. And, well, let's figure out this technology. And what if we do this? And then it hit me. I'm like, let's listen to the operator. What do they actually want versus what we're trying just, to design? Just stop for. doing that. Just stop. Yeah. I'm like, just again, Nobody does that. <laughs> what's the problem to be solved? The yeah. problem to be solved is this particular problem. We are creating this entire, uh, I guess, e I don't even know what the right word is, ecosystem of problems that were attached to this one singular insight. Strip away all that. What is the operator saying? They just need this rechargeable battery to do this thing. And the problem is that sand is getting into the compartment. Solve for sand getting the compartment don't go out and explore the latest greatest battery <laughs> the problem is sand is getting into the, how about we just stop that you know because they would you know what they were doing what the operators were doing they were opening them up dusting them out or putting an index card so sand wouldn't come into the system i'm like yeah. again you know so that's kind of that's always for me that's always that was the crystallizing moment that i thought our operators want x how do we quickly give them x and just minimize that bureaucracy in between what we want and what they're and what they what we can give them and what they want that applies with consumers as well in the CPG space. What they want is super absorb. They want absorbing care products of a high quality that's safe for their families at a reasonable price. Great, simplify just really simple first principles. Right? How do we do that? We, we enable our teams. We teach our teams. I think you mentioned a really big component. Continuously, persistently build the capabilities of our teams so they know how to remove the bureaucracy so that they're delivering best-in-class products to our consumers.
Well, you know, I think too many companies miss a trick here because when I when I went to uh, the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth and, and the Red Teaming School there in 2015, the thing that struck me as someone who'd spent the last 20 years covering corporations as a journalist and, and working with some of the biggest companies in the world is that the talent that was around me, the leadership talent, the management talent, my class was full of, full of majors, you know, field grade officers, was, was not just on par, but ahead of much of the senior leadership I'd seen in corporate America in terms of their ability to make decisions, their ability to think through complex problems, their ability to quickly bring teams together to deal with them. And these were all guys and one gal who, you know, had multiple deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. So they'd done this under, you know, they, they'd been leading and, and making decisions under high stress for a long time. And I think too many, too many corporations don't realize the talent that's out there. You mentioned your early career, Jose. I mean, if you're, if you're a lieutenant in the U.S. Army, in your early 20s, you're running a team of 40, 50, 60 people. You're responsible for hundreds of millions of dollars, potentially, of equipment. And there's nobody in business who, at that age, <laughs> is responsible for a team that size, uh, you know, resources like that. And, and so, you know, it's a really important talent pool that I think is overlooked too often. It is very much so the, the sort of the veteran capability that's out there. And I know the U S as you know, I served over there and the, and the, the sort of respect of the service and the capability it brings to industry in the UK, we're catching up. We've got the military covenant now, but that's only been in the last, not even the last decade. But as Bryce said, the capabilities that, that are brought by these individuals and because it's, it's taught from the outset, the minute you go through boot camp and then every new posting or every pr professional promotion you get, you get a specific set of training. You know, and I talk to most executives now, so how much leadership training have you had in your 25, 35 year career? They may have had a week in total. That's right. I'd had like 18 months by that you know, after 20 years. And there's That's a real the lack thing. of focus. Yeah. yeah there's really. real lack of focus. It's almost in business. It's like you're expected to learn this stuff as you climb up and you don't. It's almost they're all suffering imposter syndrome at every level and just faking it to make it. Whereas you see the guys who've gone through this early learning almost and development through that, treading a very different path and you see people following them instinctively because people see that, people sense it, they can smell them out a mile away. You know, the good guys, bad guys, good guys, bad gals, you know, the people who are there to enable their own people around them rather than take the glory and just follow me, I know what I'm doing when you really don't. I think that's one of the big things we see in what we're trying to help a lot of organizations and the progressive leaders who see this change. Because as we all know, you know, Bryce talked about these guys serving out in Iraq and Afghanistan in the, in the proper VUCA world, the proper complex, volatile environments. You know, people haven't really gone through that. So to now face into that, what we are seeing today in the commercial world, you know, geographically, globally, we are now facing so much complexity that what got them there isn't going to get them going forward. So I think this big things, fast concept and the way you're empowering and enabling people is fascinating. So I'd love to hear more. Well, it's funny you mentioned the, the training component of it and I, and I laugh at it because that's exactly right. I mean, I was so used to, you know, in the 10 years I, I went through, I can't even imagine, I can't even, I can't even recall how many training events and things that you have to do in the military, constant leadership. You're constantly being tested in a test environment, right? So that when it comes to experiencing it and applying it, it's second nature. It's muscle memory. It's no longer having to learn on the job because you just did it 17 times. If you simulated it or you did it in a training environment so, and, and then you did it in such a way, um, you know, where you were doing kind of, you know, this is, this is not a plug, but like you were either red team or blue team because we do those. We do those war gaming exercises to test all of it out. And even on the system side of which I was on, we would, we would do whiteboard testing, blackboard testing. We do all kinds of testing to make sure that in a test environment, we ran it through everything. I called it the, the kindergarten test. Break it. I want you to break it. Actively break this freaking tool because I need it to work when it's in the field. At 100% train, is, train as you fight. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. But that's a different mentality because, you know, there's an old adage. I was just reflecting on it this morning. You've heard of the 70, 20, 10 kind of model that was in management theory, it's 70% based off of experiences, 20% off of exposure, relationships, 
and then 10% of education, formal curriculum. That's kind of the management philosophy. And it's, not, it's, an, it's an imperfect one, but to your point, it's, Mark, as you said it, it's a lot of the leaders were asked, how did you get to this point in your, in your career, an executive leader? Well, I learned on the job. But then in the job, there's not deliberate, persistent, consistent training so that you can test out your theories relative to what's happening in industry on the commercial side. You see that, you know, so many organizations we work with, they'll tell you, if you ask, what are, what are you most proud of? What do you guys do right? And they'll say, we run to fires. We're great at putting out fires. We're great at firefighting. And I'm not talking about the fire agencies we were. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, 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 and that's great. But the problem is, is if you're already always putting out fires, if you're always running to the fire, A, you're never getting time to learn those lessons from fighting those fires because you're never catching your breath. But B, you're never getting that time to develop those skills. And, you know, what you're saying, Jose, is making me think back to a conversation I had with General Bob Brown, who was the, the commander of Fort Leavenworth when I was there, head of the CGSC and, and therefore head of the Red Teaming School. And while I was at Fort Leavenworth, we'd have lunch every week or two. Um, he's a great guy, um, recently retired. And one of the things that he said to me early on is he, he said, you know, I, I assume that you, you're not just here to write a book about red teaming, that you've got like a business model, you know, about how you're going to share this. I said, yeah. And I told him I was going to teach companies how to do this and organizations and stuff. He said, how are you going to do that? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I am on the president CEO council. So the president of the United States has a CEO council that's made up of some of the, you know, many of the CEOs of some of the largest corporations in the world. And, and general Brown had been tapped to be, as he put it, the, the token guy in green on, on the CEO council. Um, Cause they folks get together and they talk about leadership and share best practices. And he said, you know, I've been on this for, for a year or two and I've gotten to know these, these guys pretty well play golf with them and stuff when we get together. And he said, things that has stunned me is how little time they get for training. He said, as a three-star general, he said, I get at least cumulatively a month of training every year where I'm like not doing anything else, but I'm getting trained. I'm increasing my skill set. I'm, I'm taking, you know, graduate level classes. I'm doing these things to increase my skill set and capabilities as a leader. He said, when I sit and ask these guys who are CEOs of multinational companies how much time they get for training in a year, they laugh at me. They don't get any time by the time they're at that, that senior level. He said, if they're lucky, they get to go through an executive MBA program as part of their fast track you know, to get where they're at. But after that, it's pretty much over. That's right. And he said, so I don't understand how you're going to be able to take course that course that I was going through was, you know, three month course almost. How are you going to be able to take all this and teach it to companies? Because they don't have time for that. I was, I said, I'm going to condense it down and I condensed it down to four weeks. And even that was too much. And he was right. And so one of the things that we've, we've continually done is have to try to figure out how to streamline this, how to change the way we deliver this. So people can take a little digestible bites because Org companies don't make time for training. And that's, that's a big problem. Exactly. That's that. a big problem. We were working with one of the biggest power utilities in this country, it'll be probably figure out, easy to figure out who it was, uh, that was having a lot of problems in California because their equipment kept starting wildfires and still is. And they really wanted to bring us in and teach you know some of their senior leaders how to use red team thinking to deal with this very complex problem that they were dealing with of trying to deal with the fact that global warming was making fire risk increase and their equipment was old and and needed to be upgraded. And all this was creating kind of a perfect storm of annual wildfires. But they kept saying, we can't, we can't do this. We, it takes too long. It's not that it costs too much. It's just, you know, we don't have time for this. And that's why I asked one of my friends who, who was like a mid-level manager for this utility. I said, how long have you been there? He said, I've been there 23 years. I said, what's the longest you've ever had for training? Like how many days have you gone away for a training your entire time there? And he laughed. He said, days? He said, once in my career, I got to go through, we, I got to do a whole day training session. He said, that's it. And if you're, if you're an organization that's dealing with, in this case, an existential crisis, that is a really, the future of this company is in grave doubt right now. It's, it's also an organization that's being blamed for the deaths of scores of people. And you don't have the ability to make time 
for, hey, you know, let's at least take three days and 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 focus on on this problem and how can we learn to better address address these. You're never going to get through it. You're always going to be fighting fires, yeah. or you're always, in this case, going to be starting fires. Indeed. Starting fires. And, and this goes back back to my mantra. I'll say it again. I'll say it every week. I think slowing down to speed up. You know, getting this pe this mindset into people's heads where yes, it's going crazy out there. It, it is a high speed world. It doesn't mean you jump in the fast lane and accelerate to 100 miles an hour. It means you slowly accelerate down the ramp, or you pull over and observe, and then know when to go. And by doing that, it's going to ensure that you stay at high speed when you get there. Because if you don't, and those wheels start coming off, you get an absolute car crash. And we see that so often. It's just this mentality that it goes back to the medal of busyness. It's the proud medal. All these organizations say, oh, we're so busy, we can't possibly stop and do that. And I know it's not money anymore. Time is the most precious commodity. But you create time by creating space for yourself. And by slowing down, it allows you to get your thoughts, to gather your people around you, to get their input, and therefore become much more capable of accelerating when you need to do, when you need to avoid and pivot and change, rather than just this headlong, headstrong behavior of we're going this way, everybody on board, accelerate. You're not on a train track. You know That's not going to keep you safe anymore. And, and this, this VUCA world that we're seeing daily, organizations getting completely swept by a wrecking ball off the market because they thought they were going guns ahead, full speed. And then boom, these things hit them. And then nobody saw it coming, but somebody did. Somebody in that organization, the poor individual is right. probably trying to call it out, going, oh, oh be quiet. You know, dissenters, you've got to protect your dissenters and give them that voice to speak up. If you've got a leader like yourself, Jose, you've got teams who can confidently raise their hand, challenge you, because they know they've got your trust, you've got theirs, and you've all got a skill set that's been brought together for a reason to enable that capability to become much bigger than the sum of its parts. I want to build on something you said, Marcus, which is you said you kind of create time. You know, you want to slow down, you speed up, and absolutely. One of the things that is the genesis or some of the motivating factors behind why I wanted to pull it all together on a book, and it's called Big Things Fast and create like a field manual, is because... I firmly believe that when you have a robust, dedicated training curriculum program, when you invest in the people and build their capabilities on a persistent basis, you unlock capacity. 100%. That's really it. I mean, yet you talk about creating time. I'm talking about you unlock their personal capacity, but they become more efficient about doing the things they were doing, the fire putting away, like you were talking about, Bryce. Like, hey, you're going to be creating your fires. First, stop creating fires. How you do that, let's show you how to do that. And then... If the fire comes along, if I built your capability such that you can now solve that fire in less time for lower cost, you've unlocked capacity. So now you can address something else. Now you can innovate so you can prevent right. future fires. So for me, training and development, building, you know, really working on the human capital side of the business. And for my teams in particular, I spent my first year in the transformation, I overinvested in training and capability. I said, you know what? I'm going to help. Yes, there's lots of fires. Don't address those right now. I get it. It's going to be painful. Don't address it. I want you to focus and prioritize all the training we're investing in you, including all the red team thinking that the four week. I mean, we we went through the full master's class. Yes, you did. Because you did. I wanted them to unlock their own personal intellectual capacity to be able then to accelerate all the teams that they were assigned to. If we didn't invest in them early, there's no way we would have gotten as far as we've gotten so far in the transformation. So that's very, very important. And that's why I wanted to kind of led to the book. I'm like, all right, cool. I've been doing in the transformation space for, you know, two decades now and standing up these new organizations. And But the, the thread for me, the number one piece is the training and development and the capability building side of the house. And so I said, all right, great. Now let's put it all together in some kind of field manual and hand it to new team leaders. Because team leaders, if you think about an audience who gets kind of thrust into the position of you're a great individual contributor. Good job. Now you've got four direct reports and then you team leader. And then to your point, right? They don't yeah. get training. They get zero training. Right. Or maybe they get a couple classes. Maybe, maybe they, they self sign up for one of the many executive oh, MBA online L and D yeah. training. That these Something, organizations anything, right? That's yeah. great. But you know what? I'm going to hand you a book, a little ha a field manual, a man that you can literally how to, here are the basic principles on how to run a team, how to manage yourself and how to run a team as a brand new team leader. Well, that's so cool. 
I want to I want to talk more about what's in that book, Jose. But why don't we take a short break here? When we come back, we'll talk about what's in that field manual, and we'll also talk a bit more about digital transformation. Sounds good. Stay tuned. Forward to it. Does your organization have a red team culture? Is it an innovative, learning, and resilient culture that is continually improving, continually adapting, and continually evolving to meet the new challenges and opportunities each day brings? Or is it reactive, siloed, and hamstrung by command and control leadership that doesn't like to be challenged or questioned? Does your organization encourage diversity of thought and ensure that everyone's voice is heard? Or does it silence dissent? and promote those who toe the line. Take our free assessment and find out how your organization rates. There's a link to it in the notes below. Let's see how you score. Welcome back. So one thing we didn't mention in the first half of the show is that this book, Jose, that you're writing big things fast, you have a co-author on this book, do you not? I do. I do very much so. And he's actually on this call right now. Marcus Dimbledon. <laughs> yeah, could be. That's Hong Kong Fu once said. What's in the book? Talk to us about uh, about what, what you guys are covering with. That. And how you wrote me in. Yeah, yeah. So uh, again, Big Things Fast is kind of the big, that's, that's the brand, if you will. Uh, and the subtitle, again, still work in progress. We're still, we're still refining it and tightening it up as we go. Um, you know, it's I've mentioned a little bit of it already. It's, it's a practical how-to manual for new team leaders that are looking to facilitate meaningful growth. A little bit long right now, but the key words are it's a practical how-to manual. So that's when we were, as I was, you know, as Marcus and I's relationships evolved over the last few years, as I was building it out off of the three big pillars or waypoints, as I call them in the book, of big things fast. It's designing strategies that are realistic and practical, right? It's developing yourself and teams. So that's the develop side. So design and develop and then deliver. You got to execute ultimately. And so within the execute pillar, we're demystifying how strategic analysis, how agile and how change are basically elements are part of the flywheel to really drive incremental value. And that's the key. So a lot of people focus on the fast side, the speed. You already heard Marcus say and I, that, that that's how he and I got connected. It's you don't want to be doing stupid things faster. You want to deliver <laughs> incremental value at speed, right? I need that on a wall and a plaque. That's, that would be great advice for several governments I can think of right now. <laughs> oh, many. Well, I think that, that people really key in on the fast. And I'm like, yes, but here's the nuance is that you have to deliver incremental value at speed. And then you go, wait, well, how do you do that? And so that's really what this book is meant to be. As I mentioned before, why? The why is simple. It's VUCA world. You know, we're moving at speed. Lots of leaders need new ways of thinking and doing. Uh, we want to make sure we, we dissect what speed really means. What are the pitfalls of, move, of doing stupid things faster, things like that. And in, my, and in our conversations, as we were kind of designing the content and all of the, you know, the actual tools within the book, it's really exciting, Bryce, is that we're actually building in tools into the book itself. You know, we were inspired by a lot of the work that we did with you overall on, on Red Team, but then on other, on other capability building programs that have been a part of is that a, a lot of these new team leaders that I coach and mentor, they show me how. It's just all, they always ask, okay, I've got this new individual that is struggling with X, or we're about to come to mid-year reviews. How do you run a one-on-one? -on -one? Really basic stuff that if they just had a little field manual that they could write down all their notes and just always have with them so they can actually run their teams effectively and still grow as team leaders themselves. That's really why we built this book. And we actually introduced a fourth pillar, which is sustain. And the sustain side is about building a community of practitioners so that you can test your own theories, right? You want to test your own BS a little bit. Absolutely. And with, a, with, a, with other kind of like-minded people that are, maybe you have a community of, of all new team leaders within a certain industry. Wouldn't that be cool if you could talk to them and test what you're doing? And so we, you know, again, we took this inspiration from a lot of other uh, service providers that have these kind of small groups, Slack groups, or anything like that. Obviously, you guys have one as well. I love the Red Team Thinking Group. I I, I go there frequently, 
And so we want to make sure that we, we create this small community because it tests your theories, it busts your biases, and it helps with imposter syndrome. Yes. So for us, it's design, develop, deliver, and sustain. So those are the kind of the four waypoints within Big Things Fast, specifically focused on new team leaders. That's so important. That peer-to-peer learning is so powerful and so essential. We are working on on really trying to take that to another level and what we're doing for, for our community of practitioners worldwide. Hopefully, in the next few months, we'll be rolling out something that's really going to be a an, a key enabler for that um, because it is essential. I mean, it's one thing to go through, you know, you experienced this a little bit. I mean, our, our first program we did with you, we, we were working on a, on a strategy around a particular product. It wasn't so much a training program as, as actually red teaming right. a problem. And, but, but you got to learn some of the tools and stuff, but then taking them and practicing them with just that, it's like, Give me more. Like how let's how can we do this? And 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 I think that's the thing is that is that you need to develop facility with things by doing. And it's it's too many people. It goes back to what we were talking about before the break about the lack of time or desire or appetite for training. You know, I was working with one of the biggest tech companies, uh, one of the biggest social media companies in the world, um, before the pandemic about doing a program, and they were like, "We want all of this." but it has to be in less than 60 minutes. Like give us each, you have this many tools, let's spend five to 10 minutes each to explaining it to our people. And I said, Listen, it's not possible to do that. And they said, sure, you could just, just, just tell everybody, just give them five minutes how each tool works. And I said, I could give, I, you know, look, I could give anybody five minutes on anything. I could give you five minutes on, 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 you know, dark matter, but it doesn't mean you have to be able to figure out dark matter. You know, I mean, that's the thing is that, is that it takes time you can tell something, tell, tell people something, but you have to experience, you have to practice it. And then you have to learn from each other. As, as you said, that's where the, the community of practitioners is so key. You have to learn from each other. We learn from every single one of our clients. We're constantly evolving what we do based on the feedback we get from our clients who say, you know what, I did this and I encountered this interesting problem. How do I solve them? We're like, it's interesting. Let's think about that. Yeah. Let's tweak this so that that can be, or I tried this, but I did something a little bit different and I had this great result. And we're like, great, let's incorporate that into how we do this going forward. And we learn from each other, ideally. And, and, you know, things, any tool, any any methodology, any skill set should not be viewed as a static thing. It should be viewed as a starting point. You know, it's, it's, it's like jazz, you know, you have to learn how to play the trumpet but once you learn how to play the trumpet, well, you know, the sky's the limit. Do whatever you want with it. You know, is you're limited by your imagination. That's how I think about like the tools that we teach is that is that we're giving you a starting point. And then once you gain facility with that, though, do whatever, you know, this is your, things are going to occur to you that would never occur to me about how to use it. And so if you create a community of practitioners and everybody benefits from that learning. Yeah, so true. Um, and when another musician comes along, you play your trumpet differently that they inspire you, they, you know, drive you to try something or to, oh, hang on, let me follow that riff. And you, and you see a multi-use of that instrument, or as we see with these, these tools, and that's why we say about the Red Teaming Toolkit is you pick and choose parts of it as you need, and it becomes, as we say, muscle memory or a practice rather than a rigorous step-by-step process. You learn it by a process because that's how we best learn. But then when you're out there riffing with your jazz band, with your teammates and somebody will say one thing and they'll swing the whole team a different way to use something completely off the wall. And nobody ever considered that until Bob mentioned one thing and everyone's like, wow, this is the the, the wisdom of the crowd, isn't it? It's that none of us is smarter than all of us that we talk about where the team feel able and confident to do that and speak up and go, they don't say they go, this would be really great if we did this, but I don't want to speak up. I don't want, I don't want to say this where in a team that's enabled and confident and trusts each other, they're going to go, guys, this is crazy. But what if we did this? And no one goes, well, stupid idea. Be quiet, Bob. People go, wow, did you hear? Did you see what Bob just thought about? Let's try that. And then you get innovation. This is where the best ideas start to surface. And that then causes a flurry of other people doing the same kind of out-of-the-box thinking, which is what we know brings the best outcome of people. No, I love that. And what we... 
the way kind of my, I held my team accountable when we started holding us, ourselves accountable is that we started posting the case studies that everybody was doing. So I asked the team after we kind of all got certified as Red Team Thinking Master, I said, okay, cool. I'm going to give you, you know, let's just say, let's commit four to six weeks, apply one of the tools. We just said some, we all agree, yeah, we're going to apply one tool to whatever problem we were facing. And then we grabbed those tools and we posted them up on our little mini kind of internal SharePoint to say, all right, here's how I use you know, uh, uh, the five whys. Here's how I use lies we tell ourselves. Here's how I used influencer engineering. And we were just starting to, we're starting to build case studies of individual tools and it starts sparking. It becomes a flywheel of exactly like we talked right. about, capability building. Learn by it, doing. It unlocks yeah. capacity. It generates demand. It generates pull. And then all of a sudden, because my team is embedded in, in, in the actual market, in the enterprise, launching, facilitating and launching these other, all these kind of agile teams for you, if you will, is that then those teams are saying, well, how did you know to do that? Oh, I have this tool. Oh, I have the suite of tools. Oh, interesting. And then you plant another seed. And when you start right. planting those seeds, you start seeing the culture, the mindset shift, the behavior change. And that's, that's, you know, exactly that's that. when you're there. You know? That's when you're getting there. That's there the go. holy grail. I mean, that's, you know, that's the thing, you know, is changing the way the organization thinks, change the way the organization acts, Changes the way, changing the way the organization reflects on itself. That's that's so important. I want to talk about how you've taken these tools though and applied them to digital transformation, because I think that's so interesting. And and I think a lot of what you're doing is 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 a model for how to incorporate this approach with digital transformation. Can you talk a little bit about how yeah. you've done that? Can I just Clark? caveat oh, before yes, you yeah. start? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you and I are both big agile fanaticists, and <laughs> you two, not me, <laughs> not Bryce. You, you, you're a closet. Come on, we know, we, we I know you. this I, is one of your things. I, 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 I've never been accused of being agile in my life. No, <laughs> but absolutely. But you know, a lot of these big transformations are failing. I, mean, I don't know what the latest stats are, but you're talking seventy to eighty percent of these big things that are trying to be done fast are failing. So to just bear that statistic in mind as as Jose walks and talks us through the digital transformation that you've done at one of the biggest companies in the world. There's a lot to unpack there, right? It's digital is one of many transformations that have to happen when you're thinking about what Casey's ambition was, is, sorry, is, you know. We're trying to transform our not only just, not only the digital side, but all the elements of our business such that we are, a top tier growth, world class CPG company, right? Digital is an element of that, but you also have productivity. You also have cultural elements. You also have commercials. You have lots of different facets of transformation, of which digital is one of those, because it ends up being the backbone, right? The access to data, the differences in different markets, and things like that. So for us, as we think about the total transformation, first, it's digital is one component of that. What are the underlying truths? What are those first principles? What is our ways of working that unites all of the transformations? And that's kind of where we've really focused on is what is our compass? What does our culture stand for? What are those critical? What's our true north? What's our culture? What are our values? Making sure that we are adhering to those because as those permeate in the organization, then you see all of these a very important transformations, whether they're digital technology, product innovation, all being united under a common banner of this is our ways of working, this is our culture, this is our true north, better care for a better world. That's our goal. And we want to be top tier performance. How we get there requires all of us to be going towards that goal. And so that kind of that's the underlying story, the story arc. That's the most important thing. And second, when you think about agile, you talked about it, Marcus, right? It's sometimes you say, well, transformations equal agile. No, transformations require a major behavior change in how we operate and are working towards a common goal. Better care for a better world, top tier performance. That's kind of our, our operating model here as we think about it. The agile side of it is a way to do that, but it's only one of the ways to do that. And I think that's where we have to think about the reconciling between agile, which is a there's as agile values, agile behaviors. You know, you have the manifesto, which for those that aren't familiar, you have the four weight, the, the four be, the four values. 
And then there's agile practices like Scrum, like, 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 right? But when you overlay kind of what strategy says, and here's the analysis of where you think need to be thinking about your business model, whether and whether um, what that looks like for a digital transformation, and then you overlay and you kind of say that's kind of one bucket of work. What are we going to do? Agile shows you how you're going to do that. How might you incubate this particular piece of work? You also have the change element of it because you still have to drive that change within the organization. So if you overlay those three concentric circles, you start seeing where they becomes that flywheel of growth I was talking about before. And that's sometimes what was getting disconnected. So when I stepped in and started really kind of seeing how this transformation was coming to life across this massive enterprise, is I was working with these markets and teaching them the how. And it was very much around applying agile to a discrete growth problem that that organization, that team had. Exciting stuff. But then you realize that, okay, great, they were incubating this great solution, whether it was a new technology or new data system or a new way of bringing faster innovation from another marketplace. All good things in dramatically faster time. So incremental value at speed. All good things. But then when, when then you kind of hand it off to the business to embed, then it was like, ah, you stumbled, right? So we had to roll in change. You say, well, why are we doing this in the first place? You had to overlay strategy and how you're going to measure the success of that particular program. So strategic analysis, agile implementation, values with some practices and change have to happen concurrently for you to truly lock, unlock incremental value at speed. And that's what we talk about on the deliver side of the mat, of the book for sure. But it also delivers against whether you're doing a digital transformation or cultural transformation or commercial transformation. Absolutely. And, and the roadblock is to that whole end-to-end -end process that you talk about, you know, that final handing it off to the business, throwing it over the wall to the frontline operations. It goes back to what I think about when we talked, you know, when I first learned Project Management 101, people, process, technology. And what seems to have happened as we've moved into this digital era is that's kind of been people, process equals agile, technology equals digital. And then we've flipped it. It's all been about digital, the shiny stuff, you know, AI, chatbots, RPA, focus on the technology. And then we focus on the big new ways of working. That's agile. You know, it's this well-sold sliced bread that the consultants have marketed so well that everybody wants it. So that the executive go, right, what do we need? Digital transformation, right? That's digital technology and agile. And then the people element almost is an afterthought, if a thought at all. <laughs> and then we wonder why these things are starting to fail. And when you look at the analysis, the business agility report and you know, scrum at scale reports and the state of agile, you see that it's down to leadership. It's down to change management. And all of those things are people. You know, whatever business we're in, we're in the people business. And I like what you've, you, you've done. You saw that and then you brought this capability back to the team. As we talked about from the right at the outset, trust of our team, capability, upskilling, and enabling to just go with it rather than launching them without those things in place and then the wheels come off or focusing on the practice of agile or the technology of digital. And I think that's the uh, beauty of it. It goes back to something else that Jose said early on, which is that it's having that common mindset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. About this transformation, because I'm going to steal one of Marcus's quotes here, that new ways of working don't work without new ways of thinking. And so when you described, Jose, your, your roadmap at Kimberly-Clark, it started with thinking differently before you got into the mechanics of how we're going to do things differently. And that, to me, is the key. If, you, if, you're going to, if you're going to just overlay this on the way that we've always been thinking about our business for the past de several decades, you're not going to have a real transformation. What you're going to do is create this gap between your new capabilities and your old ways of thinking. And you need an organizing construct, a true north. Uh, some people don't like the word anchor because, oh, you're weighing me down. But you always need something, something to reorganize, to reorient yourself. Better care for a better world. Clear. Top tier performance. Clear. If that's how we, that those are the things that we always come back to. And we have our, our four ways of working and our values that we carry on, we act. And all of those things come together really nicely in terms of what's here and what's here. Then when you go to execute, you can you always have 
the light pole, you always have the, what do they call the lighthouse to come back to. And that's really right. critically important because regardless of how you, regardless of the tools, you always have the lighthouse. And so because the tools will evolve and change over time. We already talked about this over at nauseum. Buka, it will change. Guaranteed. Right. That's the only constant. Yeah. yeah. You need a constant. And then focus on the people. Then you can think about, hey, are the tools satisfying what we're trying to do? That, that's the key. Are the tools satisfying rather than we're driving because of the tools? And, right. and I've seen that so often where they're letting the technology drive them to the North Star that's not where they thought it was, or they're being so wrapped around the axle on the tool. And we must do this because this is what the tool forces us to do rather than going, what is it we want to do? And then building a tool or buying a tool that provides the capability they need for that. And we were chatting about grandmas at the break and how they taught us to tie our shoelaces. And I still remember my grandma telling me, and it goes back to this Anki we're talking about. She says, all you need in life is three things. You need love, boundaries, and direction. And I've always remembered that. And wherever I've gone, it's like, okay, the love for me as business, it's to support. Am I getting the support? Am I giving my people the support? Boundaries. Am I setting clear parameters, caveats, constraints, where we can go, where we can't go, safety. Does everyone understand that? Great. Now, do we know which way we're going? Have we got that alignment to that clarity that we talk about with the three C's? And if you've got those three things, and then you've enabled and engaged those individuals within that capable bubble, you're off to the races. You can just sit back and let go with a bit of rudder steer occasionally, but you're not doing this that we tend to see is this micromanagement from the top or the command and control top-down directive of this is how we're doing a transformation because there's nothing worse than going big transformation, top-driven, top-delivered, top-directed. Where's the actual front front line where the people who know the best things, who have got the innovation, who've got the ideas and the capability and passion to do this? Because very quickly, when that top-down behavior permeates, you see that passion go out the window. And that's the most, for me, the most soul destroying thing is when you see good people. And I call it the Terminator eye. When you see that red eye goes zoom <laughs> and you just get that sheep like uh, passivity. Go, oh, okay, I've tried. <sighs> Can't do that anymore. Well, that's why, that's why one of the things I talk about in my book is that the, the second that, that if you as a leader, the second that you, you shut someone down for, for questioning you, the second that you, shut someone down for challenging the way we're doing things is that that's the moment that you make red teaming impossible yeah, in your organization, so because now no one, no one with a mind, no one with a self-preservation instinct is going to challenge you again, you know? And, and so if you want to, you know, I, and it's sad because I, I've, I've encountered leaders over, over my career, helping, helping companies implement these ideas. I have encountered a few leaders who, Say they want to hear what their people are saying, who say that they want to create a culture that's self-reflective, that challenges itself. And yet when they when when they when they tell their teams to do that, they immediately jump in and say, Well, you know, no, you're wrong. This is the right way to do that. And, and it's like I take them aside and I say, This is why that you're not getting this is why no one tells you the truth. You, you know, you, you say you want to hear what's really going on in the organization, but as soon as you, 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 you put that invitation out, you jump down the throat of the first person who tells you something you don't want to hear. That's because they learned that on a half day leadership course. It's not sincere. <laughs> I was about to say the same thing. I'm like, because yeah, they're a leader, <laughs> yeah. I stopped going to training. They don't have any training. They yeah. don't have yeah. to right. unlearn anything because no. they Unlearn have their playbook. Unlearn. Yeah, Let's learning spin on that ability is probably the most important piece. And it's hard. Yeah really hard right in terms of saying i'm willing to be wrong show me a better way great but then the willingness this is where I, you guys talk about the i love the bias bingo right it's are are you willing to say i was wrong i've seen i've worked for tons of years like yeah, i'm wrong yeah show me a better way but are you able to unlearn the old way let it go empty the cup so that we can refill your cup with new information that's desperately hard to do Right. That is such a thing. That is, that is such a powerful thing is that, is that, uh, that there, there's a, there's a story 
there, there's an old Sufi story in the Middle East about how a guy goes to a, to a great master and he says, I want to learn. I want to learn what I've done wrong. And so he says, okay, but let's have some, some tea first. Let's have some chai. And the master starts pouring his cup and it starts, and it's pu- pouring all over. He's like, stop, stop, stop. Why are you still pouring this stuff into my cup? And he says, because you want more. And he says, but it's, it's spilling all over the place. He's like, right, because you can't fill your cup until you empty what's already in there. If, as long as you're holding on to that old information, there's no room in the cup for anything new. And you see that in businesses today. You see that where people, like you say, they get some new shiny thing. People, you know, I've seen it happen in my own book. Someone, you know, some senior leader, you know, it says, oh, this is on the bestseller list. I'm going to, you know, let's everyone read this <laughs> yeah. book, you know, and then they give it to their teams and they say, let's all follow this. But we're still doing everything the way we were doing it before. And now this is just a, it, it doesn't work. You got it. And it goes back to taking the time, taking the time to slow down, to reevaluate what we're doing and to learn, hold on to those things that are working. And jettison those things that are no longer serving us and replace them with, with something that is. That's hard to do, but it's so powerful. And it's not a threat to leadership. That's the thing, is, is asking people to, to tell you as a leader, what can we be doing better? It's not a threat to your leadership. It's a boost. It's a, it shows that you're a confident yeah. leader. I'm willing to accept it. Willing to accept it shows you're a confident leader. It's the leaders that push back. That when they walk out of the room, everyone's whispering, saying, boy, he is sure insecure. You know, he can't he can't stand anyone to, to say anything to him. So if you really are a strong leader, if you want to project strength as a leader, have the strength to listen, have the strength to learn, have the strength to evolve. Be vulnerable. That is one of the biggest strengths you can have is to show your vulnerability. And it goes back to this unlearning thing. If Because what happens is even when you've unlearned, this, as you said, Jose, these things take time. So when you then get in a situation where you're under pressure, we standard say we revert to type. So by default, you revert back to what you're comfortable with. So all those things that you thought you'd unlearned come back to the forefront. But if you've got a team who are going to go, hey, boss, you're doing that thing again. Thank you. <sighs> got it. Thank you. Check me. Yeah, the bias kicked in. Sorry, I reverted back to what I'm comfortable with. And it goes back to that Peter principle, doesn't it? Where the bosses get promoted. Then all of a sudden you find about, what are you doing? He's over your shoulder doing your job for you because he did that <laughs> 10 years ago Yeah, because he's more comfortable getting down in the weeds where he was versus being up at the top, supporting, enabling, facilitating, and making that capable entity for you to operate within. But tough stuff, tough stuff. This is tough stuff, but it's good stuff. You know, I'm mindful of the clock here and and, and I know we're, we're, we're running out of time, but I want to ask you, Jose, one question before we leave. You know, one of the things that I really admire about you is that you've been able to, as a leader, not just 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 you know lead a real transformation in your team, but to to make the case to your organization writ large for the need for new ways of thinking, the need for for developing capabilities, the need for for doing more than just embracing a buzzword, but making a real meaningful business transformation. What advice do you have for other leaders on how to carve out that space, how to justify the the investment of time to do the things that you've done at Kimberly Clark and how to to enlist the support of peers and other leaders in making a real transformation in your organization? Oh, goodness. What a way to close out the session, huh? Um, (laughs) Do you have a drum roll? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, drum roll. Here's here's the secret sauce. If you do this, you've got it all solved. <laughs> the globe is silent yeah. right now, waiting for this Find response. The book and you'll get all the answers. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's a good plug. Big thing is fast. Available <laughs> soon in a bookstore. Good question. Is, no, um, honestly, it's about we've kind of hit upon all of those threads, right? You have to have the conviction first that says we're going to build capability in the team. And we're going to prioritize capability building such that we're able to pilot a few wins. You're going to need wins. If you want to sell something in, you have to have the conviction in first in yourself and in your team to say, we're going to pilot some new things, some new ways of working. It's going to be, some are going to fail outright. Some might be really successful, but you'll have at least a compendium of case studies that, that you can share with others. 
that's how we were able to, when we piloted the, the work with the Red Team Thinking, I'm going to use the example that we did with you guys for the specific product that we were about to launch a couple of years ago and when I was in global marketing. We use that as the case study for, remember when we did this? This is how it came about. This is what we learned. This is what we liked. This is what we didn't like. Let's use that as the organizing construct to maybe try something different this space. And so you've got to have that ability to say, let's try it. So that's personal conviction, team conviction to, to build a capability and try something new. And you're going to have to lean in at risk and try to get at least one win, one case study. And then that case study leads to another one and another and another one. So we're now... People are asking me and saying, hey, I, I know you guys have trained everybody. You've certified all your all your team in, in red, to be Red Team Masters. H how do we do that ourselves? H I want to get involved in that. I want to, And that's how you're able to at least incubate and then start to scale and embed the, the capability that's really critical to driving the transformation. But it is a little bit of – got to be a little bit of a, a – <laughs> glutton for punishment if you're afraid <laughs> to take spears and you're afraid to get told no a lot then don't do it but it's you know, not for you yeah, yeah absolutely but if you've got that in you then incubate then slowly scale and embed those wins so you can start building the momentum towards a true cultural transformation that's awesome, Jose. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to share that wisdom and all, all the wisdom that you shared with us and, and with, with our listeners and viewers today. Obviously, we got to continue this conversation after the book comes out, but it's really been a pleasure. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you, Marcus. Good to see you both. It's been a lot of fun. Great seeing you, Jose. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to Red Team TV, sponsored by Red Team Thinking. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and notification icon below so you don't miss the next idea-filled episode. If you prefer to listen on the go, subscribe to Bryce and Marcus's podcast, The Thinking Leader, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen. And don't forget to visit redteamthinking.com to learn more about Red Team Thinking work and Marcus and Bryce's upcoming online courses. While you're there, take our free quiz to find out how you rate as a red team thinker and if your organization has a red team culture. Because who thinks wins.